Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hi, I'm Anju Kagal and today I'm going to be talking to you about immunological and nucleic acid amplification tests for the diagnosis of infectious diseases. In our previous lecture, these were the methods of laboratory diagnosis. There are direct methods and indirect methods and in the previous lecture, culture and antibiotic sensitivity tests were covered. Today we are going to be concentrating on antigen detection tests, specific DNA detection, indirect methods which involve detecting antibodies and of course, supportive tests. So as you know, culture takes 24 to 48 hours and clinicians are in a hurry as they need to start antibiotics and therefore, they require quick results. Therefore, there is the need for rapid tests for an early diagnosis of disease. There are many direct and indirect tests which are available. The supportive tests include doing the WBC count. If these are raised and show neutrophilia, then you could usually think of this as a bacterial infection. Lymphocytosis would indicate a viral infection. Raised C-reactive protein only indicates the presence of inflammation. However, values of more than 100 milligram per microliter suggest a bacterial infection. Procalcitonin, if it is low, one can safely say that the person is not suffering from an infectious disease. However, if you want to demonstrate its presence in a bacterial infection, you have to show a rise in titer for it to be of any significance. In the direct tests, we have the immunological tests in which we detect antigen. You can detect DNA or you can also detect genes which cause antimicrobial resistance. Immunological tests can be used to detect antibodies to a pathogen in the patient's serum usually and this comes under indirect test. Antigens of the pathogen in the specimen indicates a direct test and these tests when they are conducted in vitro are called serological tests. Nowadays, we have antigen detection tests which can be performed at the patient's bedside and these tests are referred to as point of care tests because the results are available immediately. Now, this brings me to a very important aspect, the time of collection of sample. Whenever you are going to be performing a serological test, suppose your patient has disease on day 1, which is shown in this uh, calendar. For antigen, you would detect, you would collect the sample within the first 3 to 4 days. That is the time when antigen is going to be at its highest level. When it comes to the antibody, as you all know, it takes time for the body to develop antibodies and these usually develop about from the 5th to the 7th day of the illness and therefore, when you are looking for antibody, you have to look for it round about the 5th to 7th day. Otherwise, if you do not collect the sample at the right time, you will end up missing the diagnosis. Now, this brings me to another terminology which you will come across that is paired sera. Paired sera is usually done to detect a rise in the antibody titer and so you would first collect the sample round about the 6th to 8th day of the illness and another sample about 10 to 14 days later when you will 
be able to demonstrate at, at least a four fold rise in titer. If you can demonstrate this four fold rise in titer, then it means that the patient definitely suffered from the disease. Now, let us move on to some definitions. Antigens and antibodies when they combine with each other spe specifically and in an observable manner, uh, these type of reactions are called antigen antibody reactions and the ones which are conducted in vitro that is outside the body are referred to as serological reactions. Another terminology you will come across is specificity. Now, when we talk about the specificity of the test, we talk about its ability to detect reactions between homologous antigen and antibody only, only homologous antigen and antibody and not with others. So, let me just give you an example. Uh, when you are locking your house, you are going to buy yourself a nice Godrej Navtal lock, you know, one of those big locks with a big key. And when you are going to lock the locker in your uh, in the college, you usually use one small little lock which you must have paid some 10 15 rupees for. Now, if for a, if uh, you were to lose the key of your house, would you be able to open the lock with anybody else's key? No, that is not possible. Whereas, when you lose your locker key, you always borrow a friend's key and say, Could I have your key? and you try a few keys and the lock opens. All right. So, the Navtal lock is like a specific test. It is going to react only if the particular disease is present. Whereas, the little lock which you have is one which shows cross reaction because some of the levers will react with the levers of another lock. All right. So, this is what you mean by specificity. And when a test, when we uh, test is highly specific, we say that you will get true positives and there are less false positive reactions. In other words, you will get a positive reaction only if the disease is present. Sensitivity, the ability of a test to detect very minute quantities of either antigen or antibody. Highly sensitive tests are those which show true negatives. So, there are less false negatives. They can diagnose the disease at an early stage even though the quantity of antigen or antibody may be less. Usually, a highly sensitive test shows low specificity and a high specificity test shows a low sensitivity. Now, this brings me to another uh, aspect which is the prozone phenomenon. What is the prozone phenomenon? Now, when we add antigen, when we mix antigen and antibody, if there is a zone of antibody excess, you will not get a proper reaction, you will not get a visible reaction. And this particular zone where there is antibody excess is called the prozone phenomenon. Whenever the antigen and antibody are in equal numbers, we have a zone of equivalence when you will be able to see a visible reaction. Post zone, a terminology which is not often used, but is a phenomenon where there is excess of antigen and less of antibody. Here again, your reaction will not be observable. So, then how do we overcome this prozone phenomenon? If we want to overcome this prozone phenomenon, we do what we call a quantitative test. All right. What is a quantitative test? See, in a regular test, we call it a qualitative test where we maybe we put a drop of the patient serum to a drop of antigen and we look for visible reaction. All right. Now, to rule out prozone phenomenon, what we will do is we will take the patient's serum, prepare dilutions of that serum and then add a fixed quantity of antigen. 
when we do that you will find that maybe in the earlier tubes you may not get a reaction but somewhere along the way the precipitate or the agglutinate starts appearing all right and the highest titer where it appears the highest the last tube where it appears is called the titer so this is what we call a quantitative test and in uh, microbiology we usually use it when we are detecting the presence of say brucella or we are detecting the presence of typhoid that is the time when we do these quantitative tests so let's take the example of the vidal test which is done for the detection of antibodies in a patient suffering from tight uh, from typhoid so let's say we first take the patient serum we dilute it so we can do doubling dilutions as is obvious in this slide you have a diet titer of 1 in 30 and then which goes on to 1 in 60 1 in 120 so on till 1 in 480 now you may have got a test result in 1 in 30 you got it in 1 in 60 and you got it in 1 in 20 after which the test became negative so over here we would say the antibody titer is 120 So, what is the definition of a titer? It is the highest dilution of serum, which shows an observable reaction with either antigen or antibody in the test. All right. So, usually the uh, tests which we perform, where the tube agglutination tests which we perform, are the ones in which we are looking for antibody in the patient's serum. okay so now let's look at the types of immunological tests uh some of them you need to know uh because you need to know the principles of the reactions how they occur and how long they take to perform in addition these are the tests which will help you later on when you all become clinicians so you need to know which tests you need to order for which particular diseases so we'll start with of course the list of immunological tests is many but we'll start with the agglutination reaction what are agglutination reactions these are reactions when a particulate antigen is mixed with its antibody in the presence of an appropriate electrolyte at a suitable temperature and ph when this happens the particles are clumped or agglutinated which can be seen visibly now what are the applications of agglutination reactions in the laboratory we use the slide agglutination test which confirms the diagnosis of a particular organism so what we do is that when we culture a particular organism we will emulsify the growth in saline now this organism is where the antigen is present to this we add anti serum when we add the anti serum we will then gently rotate the slide and within a few minutes we will see clumps now like i mentioned this is where we do it for the identification of a bacterial isolate the other place where this test is used is in blood grouping and cross matching and this is what your test will look like this is the emulsified growth and this is the part which has agglutinated the other common agglutination test which will help the clinician diagnose a condition is the tube agglutination test this is a quantitative estimation of antibodies and the tests which we perform are the vidal test for the diagnosis of enteric fever or typhoid fever the standard tube agglutination test for brucellosis the wheel felix test for typhus fever the cold agglutination test for mycoplasma and the paul bunnell test for infectious mononucleosis so uh, if we were to look at how the test is performed we've got a test tube containing the patient serum 
which has been diluted from 1 in 20 to 1 in 640. To this we add a fixed volume of particulate antigen. We incubate the sample and we start looking for the clumps to form. Now the highest dilution which is showing a visible reaction over here is the tube which shows a 1 in 160 dilution and therefore the titer of this sample would be 160. This is what I had mentioned to you all earlier too. The heterophyll agglutination test is another tube agglutination test but over here one organism is used to detect the antibody against another organism because of antigen cross reaction. All right. Now, over here the wheel Felix test is a very good example of that. So, is the cold agglutination test as well as the Paul Bunnell test. In the wheel Felix test, rickett cell diseases are diagnosed using antigen which has been derived from proteus species. This is because the rickett cell antigens cross react with the rickett cell antigens and the proteus antigens are similar and the antibodies which are produced against the rickett cell disease will react with the proteus antigen. The tube agglutination tests take about 18 to 24 hours before they can be positive. So, these tests have been uh, replaced by faster what are called passive agglutination tests. It is called passive because a soluble antigen is attached to a carrier particle. These carrier particles could be red blood cells. The carrier particle does not take play a part in the reaction. It is basically the antigen which is present on the surface of the carrier particle and if antibody is added, it causes the red blood cells to agglutinate. This test was used for the Rose Waller test in the past when we needed to dis diagnose the presence of rheumatoid arthritis factor. Today, the passive agglutination tests use latex as the carrier particle and this a drop of this latex particle containing antigen is added to the patient serum containing antibody. The slide is gently ro rotated and within a minute or two we can see agglutination and decide whether the patient has that particular antibody or not. Reverse passive agglutination test, here the latex particle is coated with antibody. Once the antibody covers the latex particles, we add the patient serum which may contain antigen and when there is agglutination, it indicates that the particular antigen was present in the patient's serum. The reverse passive agglutination test when antibody is attached to red blood cells is called a reversed passive heme agglutination test. RPHA is done for the diagnosis of syphilis. If you get a carpet formation, this test is usually performed in micro titer plates. And if you get a carpet at the bottom, it indicates a negative reaction, whereas a button which shows a glutination indicates a positive reaction. Coagglutination is another form of reverse passive agglutination. Here we use a Cohen strain of Staph aureus. Now, the peculiarity of the Cohen strain of Staph aureus is that it has a receptor for the FC fragment of antibodies. All right. So, when an antibody is mixed with the Cohen strain of Staph aureus, what will happen is that the FC portion will attach to these receptors which are present on Staph aureus. And when a sample containing antigen is added to this, the uh, Staph aureus strains will, uh, will agglutinate and therefore, this is called the co-agglutination test. So, now we are done with the agglutination reactions, we now move on to precipitation reactions. So, the definition of a precipitation reaction is when a soluble antigen combines with an antibody in the presence of electrolytes 
at a suitable temperature and pH, antigen antibody complexes form an insoluble precipitate. When these precipitates remain suspended, we refer to them as blockules. And the most common test which is performed using this principle is the venereal disease research laboratory test or commonly called the VDRL test which is used for the diagnosis of syphilis. What are the applications of the precipitation test? Uh, in the laboratory, the ring test is used for the grouping of streptococci by the Lansfield's technique. As you know, streptococci are grouped into group A, B, C, D. Now, if we have isolated a streptococcus, we want to determine whether it belongs to group A, B, C or D. All right. So, what we do is we take an extract of the streptococcal uh, of the streptococcus and uh, let it suck by capillary permeability into a tiny capillary tube. Uh, you are all familiar with doing clotting time for which when we prick a patient's uh, finger, uh, the blood and we put a capillary tube at next to the drop of blood, the blood gets sucked into the capillary tube. So, similarly when you put this capillary tube in a streptococcal extract, it will get sucked in. Then we put it in group A antisera and allow that to be sucked in. Similarly, the next tube you do in group B, C, D accordingly and then after that you leave it standing for some time and within half an hour or so you would be able to see a line of precipitate. This is what we do when we are doing the ring test for streptococci Lansfield classification. The slide test for VDRL is called a slide flocculation test. Here the patient sera is collected and inactivated. In the qualitative test, all we do is we put a drop of the patient serum and then put a drop of the antigen and after rotating it, we look at it under the microscope to look for visible clumps. All right. Now, because of the prozone phenomenon, we do not want to miss a diagnosis of syphilis. Therefore, we prepare doubling dilutions of the serum to which fixed antigen is added. After this, the slide is placed on a VDRL rotator and we later under the microscope look for the presence of blockules. So, this is what a non-reactive reaction looks like, this is what a weakly reactive reaction is and this is a strong, strongly reactive VDRL test. Now, I move on to immunodiffusion tests. These tests basically use the principle of precipitation in gel and the advantage of this is that the reaction is easily visible because of the presence of a distinct band. These bands are stable, they can be stained and preserved and the test is performed in 1 percent agar or in agar rose gel. Agar rose gel is a more refined form of the agar. So, the immunodiffusion test consists of single diffusion in one direction. Now, let me first explain to you what this gel is. You all have all eaten jelly, have not you? And have any of you all ever prepared it at home? Well, let me tell you how you should make jelly. So, you take this packet of jelly, maybe strawberry, raspberry or pineapple flavored and it comes in the form of granules to which we add boiling hot water. We stir it, keep it on the flame till all these particles dissolve and after that we allow it to cool and keep it in the refrigerator where it solidifies. Now, when we use agar, we you take agar, put it in a solution containing the correct electrolytes and we heat it so that all the agar dissolves. After that, we can pour it into a test tube and we can then use it for detecting the presence of antigen or antibody. 
the advantage of using agar is that one it is transparent and the second thing is that it solidifies at room temperature. So, now if we take agar which to which we have added antibody and pour it into a test tube then form an a layer of antigen on it the antigen will diffuse into the antibody containing gel and you get a line of precipitate. This is referred to single diffusion in one direction because the antigen has moved in only one direction. Now, suppose you have taken antibody in gel, then you have put a layer of plain agar and layered an antigen on top. Now, what happens is this antigen starts diffusing into the plain agar and the antibody starts diffusing into the plain agar and wherever, wherever the two meet in optimal concentrations, you get a line of precipitate. This is called double diffusion in one dimension. Now, if you were to perform this test in test tubes, it would take forever take almost 48 to 96 hours before you see any visible lines. So, this is replaced by doing the same test on a slide. So, suppose you have taken a slide on which you have poured the agar, after that we punch holes in this. In one hole we put antibody and in the other we put antigen, we keep this in a moist chamber and the next day we look for a line of precipitate all right this is the simplest form this takes about 24 to 48 hours to occur because the layer of gel is very thin all right now this particular test can often be used to identify different antigens all right so we can sometimes we take the antibody here and we add two different antigens now here if the two meet, the two lines meet, then we call it a reaction of identity, which indicates that the antigens are the same. If you find that the lines do not meet, they meet, but do not cross each other or do not form an arch arc like they had formed over here, but one has extended a little beyond the others, then we call it a reaction of partial identity. In the fourth instance, if their lines have crossed each other, then we call it a reaction of non-identity. That means, the antigens are completely different. Now, where do we use this agar gel diffusion in the routine laboratory for diagnosis? Double diffusion in two dimensions in the laboratory is used when we do the LX gel precipitation test. The LX del precipitation test is done for the diagnosis of toxigenic strains of diphtheria bacillus. Uh, now, what we do is we take a plate in which we have got media and before the media has set, we put a strip of filter paper containing anti diphtheretic serum. All right. Then we allow the plate to set after which we take a positive control that is a diphtheria bacillus culture of diphtheria bacillus which is a toxigenic strain and we streak it perpendicular to this filter paper. Then we streak the culture of the patient sample and then a culture which does not produce toxin. We let this remain overnight and the next day we look for an arrowhead precipitate near the positive control. If it appears for the test sample, it means that the test sample was a toxigenic strain. Radial immunodiffusion test is an agar gel diffusion test which is used to quantitate either antigen or antibodies. The radial immunodiffusion test is generally used when we are doing quantitation of IgG or IgM immunoglobulins. So, what is done is we take a slide on which we pour a gel in which antibody has been incorporated. After that, we punch wells. All right. Now, these three wells will have 
a known concentrate of antibody in doubling dilution all right so this contains the gel contains anti antibody and these wells contain immunoglobulin made in doubling dilutions and this is where we will put our test sample we leave this overnight and after 24 to 48 hours we look for a zone of precipitate to form all right now we uh, we measure the diameter and draw a graph of antigen antigen concentration against ring diameter square all right and we can take this diameter square and find out the concentration of the unknown sample now i move on to electrophoresis electrophoresis is a procedure by which we use the same gel in a on a slide we make a well on one side in which we add the patient serum and we pass a current which moves from positive to negative and what happens is that the protein which is present in the patient serum also starts migrating now the fastest moving thing is the marker you know we put a little marker so that we know when our reaction gets over the fastest moving protein product is albumin then it is formed by the then we are it's followed by the alpha 1 alpha 2 the beta and the gamma chains immunoglobulins or antibodies lie in this particular area in the gamma region all right now these particular the uh, separations can be visualized by staining the slide this is done with amido black and what we get is different density of the particular product and this can then be drawn into a graph so that we can find out the quantity of a particular substance in the patient's serum now this gets very complicated you need to have a densitometer you need to have the graph and then you need to convert the thing into a quantitation thing we can do what is known as immunoelectrophoresis where we can find out the presence or absence of particular antibodies or antigens in a patient's sample here we take a slide on which we have poured gel we make a well in which we are going to add the patient serum all right after that we are going to pass an electric current so that the different components present in the patient serum will separate now all of these are not visible to the naked eye except for the marker which will tell you where the reaction how far your protein separation has occurred you want the protein separation to occur right till the end so that everything has separated out the next day we put antibody in the trough and we allow it to diffuse in a moist chamber and at the end of that you will get arcs of precipitate where antigen and antibody move in optimal concentrations all right now this particular test is often used for the diagnosis of wilson's disease where the absence of this is a ceruloplasmin arc and absence of a ceruloplasmin arc indicates that the patient has got wilson's disease so this is a common place where immunoelectrophoresis is utilized the other place where immunoelectrophoresis is used is when you want to speed the agar gel diffusion remember i told you this agar gel diffusion for this line of precipitate to form it takes almost 24 to 48 hours all right so we want to speed this up therefore what we do is we take a slide in which we punch two wells in what we put antigen in the other we add antibody we pass a current and 
the antigen will diffuse towards the positive pole and the antibody diffuses in the opposite direction where they meet an op optimal concentration a precipitate forms. The results of this test are available in 30 minutes, sometimes it may take a little longer, but usually in 30 minutes you can get the results. So, it is faster than waiting for an agar gel diffusion and this particular test can be used for detecting antigen in the CSF of patients in whom you may be suspecting cryptococcal meningitis or meningitis due to pneumococcus when you want to detect the presence of hepatitis B surface antigen in serum, you can do it by this test. You can also use this test to quantitate the particular antigen. Again, what you need to do is take three known dilutions and compare the graph with the precipitate produced by the unknown dilution, the patient sample. Radial immunodiffusion again gave you results within 24 to 48 hours. If you want to hasten this, we do what is known as rocket electrophoresis. Here you take a gel in which you have incorporated antibody, you punch wells. In the first three wells, you put known antigen that is different dilutions of the known antigen and in the fourth one, you put the test sample. Again, you pass a current and the height of the rocket is proportionate to the concentration of the antigen. So, you can draw a graph using these three heights and from the graph you can read off the concentration of your unknown sample. This again takes about half an hour to one hour. Now, I move on to another aspect which is true dimensional cross immunoelectrophoresis. In two dimension cross immunoelectrophoresis, we usually do it when we want to quantitate say antibodies which are present in the patient sample. So, what we will do is we will make a well rather a trough in which you have put the patient's serum sample. Then you will pass a current so that the different components separate out. After this, this gel is usually for poured on a big slide all right we cut off this part of the gel and then we add anti serum which has been incorporated in gel we pour gel in which anti serum has been incorporated this is poured over here and we allow this to pass you pass a current again in this direction so this is a second electrophoresis so two dimensional cross immunoelectrophoresis and the height of the arcs will give you the quantity of a particular component which may be present in the patient's serum. So, we are done with agglutination reactions, we are done with precipitation reactions. We now move on to the complement fixation test. The complement fixation test uses the ability of antigen antibody complexes to fix complement all right it's a very sensitive test and can detect minute quantities of antibody and antigen the test is conducted in two steps and consists of five reagents the five reagents are one the antigen second the antibody and third the complement. This takes part in the first part of the reaction. The antibody may usually present in the patient serum and the second part is called the indicator uh, component which consists of sheep RBCs with amboceptor and what is amboceptor? It is rabbit antibody to this these sheep RBCs all right. So, basically what happens is that if sheep RBCs and amboceptor come in contact with complement, there will be lysis of the RBCs. All right. So, now, now let us move on to how the test is performed. So, what happens is that you got the patient serum in which you are looking for antibody to which you will add the known antigen 
and complement. Now, if antibody is present, an antigen antibody complex will form and all the complement will get used up. If antibody is absent, the complement does not get fixed. So, then we add sheep RBCs with amboceptor. If antibody is present, complement is fixed, the RBCs will remain intact and therefore, no hemolysis indicates a positive test. However, if antibody is absent, the complement is free to cause hemolysis of the sheep RBCs and hemolysis indicates a negative test. The complement fixation test is also referred to as the Wasserman test when we are doing zero diagnosis of syphilis. It is also used for some viral and fungal infections, particularly coccidioidomycosis. The newer tests which are done for the diagnosis of infectious diseases, one of them is the enzyme linked immunosorbent assay. Now, the enzyme linked immunosorbent assay is also referred to as the ELISA test and it uses the uh, principle of detecting the presence of enzyme with the help of a substrate. So, now let me tell you what a direct ELISA cell test is. Now, you take a virus sample which you coat on the top of a micro titer plate. All right. To this you will add antigen sorry antibody to which enzyme has been conjugated. So, this is the antibody and this is the enzyme conjugate. Now, if antigen was present this antibody would stick on to the antigen all right. Any excess antibody which is present is then washed off. After that we add substrate. Now, this substrate will react with the enzyme and produce a colored reaction. Usually, the enzyme which we use is horse radish peroxidase. In the sandwich ELISA, sorry, there is one more which has got left. In the indirect ELISA, you have a protein coated container antibodies bind to this protein all right antibodies which were present in patient serum will bind to this thing so let's like take an example of suppose we are diagnosing hiv all right in hiv we look for the antibodies of the patient serum so the bottom of the well over here is coated with antigen against hiv to this we will add the patient serum if antibody is present it is going to attach to the antigen the excess antibody is washed away and then we add anti antibody to which enzyme has been added. So, if antibody was present this anti antibody will stick on that means the enzyme will be present and when you add the substrate you will get a change in color. So, I am going to do this again. So, in the indirect ELISA test, let us take the example of looking for antibodies to HIV. Over here in the micro titer plate, we have antigens for HIV which are coated. We will add the patient's serum which contains antibody. This antibody will stick on to the antigen. The excess antibody which is present over here will be washed away, after which we will add anti antibody which is enzyme linked. This enzyme linked antibody when it attaches to the antibody will stick on and excess is washed off. When we add the substrate since the enzyme is present you will get a color change. This is called the indirect ELISA test. We also have a sandwich ELISA test. Now, why do we have all these tests? We have all these tests because what they do is that as we increase the number of layers, 
the, the sensitivity of the test improves. So, in the sandwich ELISA test, we have bound capture antibody to which we will add patient serum which contains antigen. If antigen is present to this particular antibody, it will stick on and then we will add antibody which is enzyme labeled which will again stick on to the antigen and when we add the substrate, we will get a color change. So, this is how you visualize it. This is a micro titer plate in which we have just added after where we have added the antigen, the antibody and the enzyme labeled anti-antibody. Once we have added the substrate, the density or the color change determines how much of the particular antibody is present in the patient's serum. Now, the ELISA test takes about 6 hours to perform and it is used for the diagnosis of various bacterial, viral and parasitic diseases. It can detect the presence of rotavirus in fe feces. It can detect the presence of hepatitis B surface antigen in patient serum, HIV antibodies in serum, it can detect the presence of HAV virus, hepatitis A virus, hepatitis C virus, all these can be detected by the ELISA test. It is both a qualitative as well as a quantitative test. It is widely used in zero surveillance, especially zero surveillance of HIV. And it is also used in the diagnosis of acute and chronic phase disease. So, an IgM ELISA usually indicates an early infection, whereas an IgG ELISA will indicate a late infection. IgE is also an antibody which can be detected by the ELISA test, although it is present in very small quantities in the serum. Another type of test is the radioimmunoassay. The radioimmunoassay is just like the ELISA except that over here the ligand is labeled with radioisotopes and you need a Geiger counter to be able to count the number of radio, radioisotopes present in the sample. This is a hazardous test. It is replaced by tests like the ELISA where you do not need complicated equipment and you do not have problems with disposing of your uh, chemicals which have been used. It is not commonly used in the diagnostic microbiology lab, but is often used for quantitation of IgE in patients who suffer from allergies because IgE cannot be quantitated by a test like radial immunodiffusion, we can do it by the radio immunoassay. So, like I said, the attempt is always to try and hasten the time of giving test results. So, the ELISA tests are, have now been replaced, not necessarily replaced, but we have got faster tests called the immunochromatographic tests, which help us diagnose disease within half an hour to two hours. You have what are known as the lateral flow assays, in which you have the patient sample which contains antigen. You will have antibody over here, which has been labeled either with gold, latex or a fluorescent stain and you will have a line of antibodies here and a control line. Now, the patient sample is added to this pad. It will combine with the antibody over here and this antibody will then combine with the specific antibody and there is a control line. This control line is only to determine whether the test is valid or not. Now, we will see the immunochromatographic test for dengue. In the case of dengue, we get a cartridge in which there is a control 
we can detect the presence of IgG antibodies in the patient serum, IgM antibody or NS1 antigen. All right. So, we add a drop of the patient's blood over here, we allow it to diffuse and then we look for the presence of a line. Now, remember if the control line is absent in any place, then it means that the test is invalid. All right. So, now let us look at what the results will show. In case you see an IgG as well as an IgM line, it indicates that the patient may be having a recent infection as well as a past infection. If only IgG is present, it means that the patient does not have a recent infection. And if you see NS1 antigen, it means that the patient is suffering from dengue. Now, this test gives you results within a few hours and therefore, a clinician who has a patient with uh, PUO uh, need not start antibiotics or at least de-escalate if he gets to know that the patient is positive for NS1 antigen. Are you all aware about phosphorescence? You know about the coral reef in Australia which gets brightly lit up at night, it is because of phosphorescence of the corals which are present in the coral reef. Now, the same principle is used over here where fluorescent dyes show up brightly when they are exposed to UV light. So, over here what we are going to need is a fluorescent microscope with the help of which we will be able to visualize this particular fluorescent dye. And usually in this test what is done is that an antibody is tagged with a fluorescent dye and if it is present in the sample, if it if antigen is present in the sample this antibody will stick on and the fluorescence would be either red, green or orange depending on which particular dye has been used. Now, the immunofluorescence assays are done for the rapid diagnosis of bacteria, viruses and other antigens, usually for the presence of rabies virus antigen in a brain smear. But the disadvantage of the test is that you need to use a separate conjugate for each of the antigens. Now, let us look at what a direct immunofluorescence test is. So, you have an antigen on the surface of which is present an epitope. Epitope is also what is known as an antigenic determinant. Now, when you add fluorescent labeled antibody, if the antibody is specific for that antigen, it will stick on and after you wash the slide, you will observe it under the fluorescent microscope and you will see the presence of a dye. All right. In the indirect immunofluorescence test, you add unlabeled antibody which is specific for that particular antigen. So, if the antigen is present, the unlabeled antibody is going to stick on and then you add anti antibody which is fluorescent labeled. So, if the antibody had stuck on to the antigen, this will stick on and you will observe it as fluorescence. All right. Again, why do we do this? As we increase the layers, we improve the sensitivity of the test. So, if you got say a rabbit dog, you take the brain smear, put it on a slide and you will add antibody which is fluorescent labeled against rabies. This will stick on and you will see a fluorescence in the smear which you have prepared indicating that the dog has died of rabies. So, we now move on to the last of the immunological tests which is the neutralization test. This is a test which is usually applied to detect the presence of toxins in vivo that is in the body. The, the common example is the Schick test which used to be done in the past to diagnose diphtheria and in vitro the most common place where we use a neutralization test is the Nagler reaction. Now, the Nagler reaction is a test which is done to detect the presence of toxins produced by Clostridium perfringens 
which is caused in gas gangrene all right so what happens is that when you have a growth now uh, when a patient is suffering from gas gangrene what we will do is we would collect the sample from the depth of the tissue and then we would grow it in the laboratory after we have grown it in the laboratory we want to determine whether this was a toxigenic strain whether it was clostridium perfringens or whether it was another clostridium which resembles perfringens but does not produce gas gangrene so what we will do is we will take what is the willis and hobbs medium all right this is in a plate and we will divide the plate into two parts on one part we will layer antitoxin then we will put a control of clostridium sporogens we will streak it across and we will this clostridium sporogens when it uh, grows will produce a line of opacity at the same time we have also streaked the test strain in which we are looking for clostridium perfringens and we will find that the opacity is present on the side where antitoxin is not present that is in other words the antitoxin has neutralized the toxin on the side where antitoxin was present neutralization tests are used mainly uh, when we are trying to detect the presence of a virus like say polio virus in a stool sample or we are trying to detect the presence of antibodies to a virus so usually it is to antibodies in a virus and let's just take the example of uh, let's just take the example of polio now you know when polio virus is added to a cell line you get a cytopathic effect all right now if in a population you are trying to detect whether antibodies are present in a population of patients antibodies against polio virus are present in these patients then what we will do is we will take a virus suspension in a test tube to which we will add the patient serum containing the antibody now if antibody is present the virus will get neutralized and when you add this combination this uh, antigen uh, this, this viral suspension plus the patient serum when you add it to a tissue culture you will find that there will be no cytopathic effect however if antibody was not present the virus would not have got neutralized and if in the cell line you see that there is a cytopathic effect it means that antibody was absent in that particular patient so the title of this test would be the dilution of serum which no longer is able to neutralize the virus so let's get back to the first few slides where i was talking about direct tests i have spoken to you about the immunological tests i will now tell you about detection of dna which is done by the nucleic acid amplification test over here we use what is known as the polymerase chain reaction pcr now pcr is a test which detects the dna of organisms this the advantage of the test is that it can be detected even if it is present in very small quantities so especially you know when you have a patient who is suffering from meningitis and you want to find out the cause of that meningitis doing a pcr helps in diagnosing the condition early however the disadvantage of the pcr test is that it does not differentiate between live or dead bacteria and therefore at all times can give false positive reactions so how does it work we'll start with looking at the structure of dna as you know dna is in a in the form of a double helix and has complementary base pairing so in pcr what we do is we need to first extract the dna 
of the organism that we are looking for. So, like let us say we have got a patient with tuberculosis, all right, he has got tubercular meningitis, you have taken the CSF sample, you are going to put it in these tiny little tubes called microvials and you are going to extract the DNA with the help of certain chemicals. Once this DNA is extracted, we are going to add primers which correspond to the particular pathogen we are looking for. We are going to add nucleotides and we are going to add DNA polymerase. Then we are going to place this tube in a thermal cycler. Now, this thermal cycler will start playing around with the DNA and what does it do to the DNA? In the first instance, the mixture is heated to a temperature of 94 to 96 degrees Celsius, where it will break the hydrogen bonds of the DNA. These hydrogen bonds are very loosely applied, all right, and the DNA separates out as you can see over here. It is separated into two strands, all right. So, this is a single stranded DNA and this is the second strand. The next reaction is that of annealing. This occurs at 68 degrees where the mixture is cooled. Now, remember I told you there were primers, all right. There were primers which will now, which are specific for this particular DNA segment which will attach, all right. So, they will anneal with the complementary DNA sequence. Then with the help of the nucleotides, there will be extension. Now, this reaction takes place at 72 degrees Celsius, all right, and it is at this temperature that the DNA polymerase can act, all right. It extends the primers adding nucleotides onto the primer in a sequential manner. So, what you have ended up getting is from one DNA strand, you have got two DNA strands. So, this process of denaturation, annealing and extension continues, from two you will get four strands and this process continues. Now, once the process is complete, we will take this same little while and we have to detect the DNA. So, what has happened is that, that one may be one strand of DNA or very few strands of DNA which were present in the sample have now been increased in number, they have multiplied many times over, all right. So, what we will now do is we will subject this to gel electrophoresis. Now, you know what a gel electrophoresis chamber looks like, there is this particular plate which contains the gel and we will cut wells in it and put the particular DNA sample. All right, so let us just recap, we have taken the DNA which was present here, we have multiplied it many fold and then we have inoculated it into the gel and passed a current so that the particular uh, DNA will separate out according to its electrophoretic mobility. These DNA bands are then stained to show their presence. Now, the bands can be compared against each other to a known size standards like you, you have what is known as a marker. You know this marker will tell you at which level your DNA strand is present and this DNA strand will be particular for a specific organism, all right. So, this is the amplification product which is present at 250 base pairs. Coming to the clinical applications of PCR, it is used for the diagnosis of various infectious diseases by demonstrating the DNA of the particular organisms, 
organisms which are difficult to culture like mycobacterium tuberculosis from CSF, H influenzae, streptococcus pneumoniae, many viruses can be demonstrated within a day by the PCR test and this test is done when we need quick results. Uh, PCR can also be used to demonstrate the presence of genes or mutations in genes causing antimicrobial resistance. For example, mutations in the RPO B gene for rifampicin resistance in the case of mycobacterium tuberculosis will indicate that the patient has multi drug resistant tuberculosis. I would like to talk about one of the revolutionary tests which is a PCR test which can be used not only to detect mycobacterium tuberculosis, but also tell us whether that particular strain is rifampicin resistant or not. This is done by again a quantitative uh, what we will refer to as a real time PCR in it is a semi quantitative method and it is done in a machine called the gene expert machine where it tells you how much mycobacterium tuberculosis is present and whether it is rifampicin resistant or not. The advantage of this machine is that it is uh, done it can be done at the, in the field area it is a very simple test it all you need is some electricity uh, you it is a cartridge based test and to this cartridge you add the patient's sputum and it is kept for mixing for some time after which it is put into a machine and this machine will then within 90 minutes tell you whether MTB is present and whether it is MDR or not. Now the biggest advantage here is that in a country where tuberculosis is so endemic if we can get results fast we can not only treat the patient properly, but we can also uh, prevent the spread of these MDR strains. Therefore, when we look at immunological tests and we look at the nucleic amplification tests, the emphasis has always been on trying to improve not only the specificity, the sensitivity and also the turnaround time of all these tests. Thank you very much for this patient hearing and I hope this lecture was beneficial to you.